<laughs> Welcome to the Pope on Film. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is... Reverend Steve Galindo, founder of the Church of Edwood at edwood.org, and you should go because it's all pretty and stuff. We really needed a, a drum snare right there when you said yeah. the name. Just a just a little, you know, that would have been perfect. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I've got my moments. So how's it going this week? Oh, uh, good. I'm drinking this new root beer. I'm, I get a lot of root beers, a lot of different root beers, and I'm drinking this one right now, and it's just horrible. I opened it up once we started, and I took a drink right when you were saying your name, and oh, man, this is hideous. This is a horrible, horrible root beer. It's like I'm drinking a vanilla ice cream. It's really, really oh. bad. Like a vanilla and almond ice cream. Really gross. Uh, Tommy Knocker's original root beer. Don't drink it. Tommy <laughs> Knocker's, okay. Tommy Knocker, yeah. not Tommy Knockers, not like Stephen King or anything like that. Oh, not Tommy Knockers, okay. No, not Tommy Knockers. Because I always thought that that was a guy named Tommy really into tits. It, it's got some, like, minor on, like, a minor or perhaps a, uh, perhaps a, one of Snow White's dwarfs. It's really, really horrible. <laughs> and if you want to hear more wonderful root beer reviews, you should go to my YouTube page uh, and search Root Beer Show. I have a very bizarre uh, show on YouTube. And and are you going to have a show on this particular root beer? Maybe, maybe not. This yeah. is pretty hideous, so perhaps <laughs> I might have to. Well, they, yeah, you know, they can't all be winners. No, they can't all be winners. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention something. Um, I yeah. wanted to give a shout-out to a website. All right. I um, Have you been on Kickstarter? Have you, have you seen that? Have you liked it? Have you given money to it? Uh, I've, I've given quite a bit of money to Kickstarter because I wind up having a lot of friends who try to crowdfund shit. You know, yeah. uh, I don't. I don't like peruse it though. You know, I don't go looking for people to give money to. <laughs> well, I've you know I've I've seen a lot of things on Kickstarter and I've known a lot of people that have done it. And I always say that I I should one of these days come up with something Ed Wood related and put on there. But I've, I've never consciously thought of anything. But someone reached out to me a couple of months ago about a Kickstarter that they were doing. And I felt that it was important enough that I should um, give money to it and try and tell people about it. It's already happened. And the that time has already passed, and and they got enough money. But it it it's from a website called alternatehistories.com. It's a really wonderful website. They sell a lot of old-looking posters and works of art and uh, things you can hang up in your wall, and they look like very old, old-school maps and photographs, except it'll be an old map of New York from 1910, except yeah. it'll also have Godzilla attacking. Or uh, it, It's really amazing, the alternate histories that they came up with, and the person who runs that website, he got this, idea of um, getting bad movie scripts and binding them in it, ha printing them and binding them and making them look like an old Shakespearean script and there, really? there were yeah it, and I, I gave money to it and I just got my script in the mail a couple of weeks ago and it's a really beautiful hand bound uh 100% accurate script of Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. Cool. Except it looks so nice. It looks... It, it's really impressive looking. I had a I had a hard time because the three movies that were available to to get
get as a script were uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, or Manos the Hands of Fate. I felt that I should have Plan 9 from Outer Space, because, of course, I have a religion based on Ed Wood, but I really wanted Manos. Because yeah. <laughs> that's just, that's just a, a work of art in how bad that is. Manos, I could barely even get through the Mystery Science Theater version. Yeah, when a movie, that movie is, is just that bad, it's like, you know what, movie, you win. <laughs> you win this round, Manos. <laughs> yeah, even when uh even when the Mystery Science Theater version is bad, that's when you know that it's a really bad movie. Yeah, when they can't even find up and find anything to make fun of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to give a shout out to alternatehistories.com. I absolutely love this Nice hand bound. Uh, I I I've been working on a Ed Wood Bible for I don't know a couple of decades now, but a, and one day I'll get it done. But until then, this really does feel like I've got like my own little Bible in my hand. Yeah. It's really wonderful. There's a nice little drawing of Tor Johnson on the cover, and it even ends with the the classic the end filmed in Hollywood USA on the last page it's really quite impressive and i like it i think i have found the site uh it looks like they also have greeting cards and t-shirts and stuff yeah it's it's really incredible some of the some of the posters i i keep not going to their website cuz i want to not spend all of my money there. <laughs> but they'll have like a like a old poster of like Pittsburgh or Chicago except it's being attacked by aliens or zombies or it's really quite incredible. It's not just for bad movie lovers but also some really amazing Godzilla uh posters <laughs> on here. It looks absolutely normal like the I specifically want their Arizona map and it's an old map of Arizona except it shows you uh, Apache County and uh, Navajo Navajo country and Martian country monster yeah. country zombie country it's it's quite amazing at first glance it looks you say oh look at that beautiful piece of art this person must be uh very very smart and cultured Ooh. But then you take a closer look and you go, oh, I, I see, uh, Rodan is attacking. All right, then. There's yeah, some really she, uh, nice ones. There's some really Godzilla nice ones with a robot that. monster, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. There's a specific one for Citizen Kane, except it's it says uh, it's for Citizen Vilnar. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, meet it's the monster terrific. behind the mask. <laughs> It's really quite an amazing web page, and I really want to promote them because it's the the one and only thing I've ever given money to on Kickstarter for, and I'm just I got a nice little crush going for them right now. Yeah, I have uh, posted their link over in our Facebook group. Um, didn't really have a chance to talk about that, but we have a Facebook group. Did you see that or a Facebook? Group? Yes, we have a Facebook group. Yay! Everybody should uh, go to the Facebook group. Like we it. also have a Twitter. Ooh, we have a Twitter? Cool. Yeah. At Pope on Film. Cool. I've got a I've got like three hundred followers on Twitter, so I'll let them know that. Yeah. So come follow us. Uh the email address that's Pope at undeadgow dot com. Cool. And we are on Stitcher. Uh, a thing I totally do not understand yet. It, it's kind of like an alternative to iTunes. Is it for, like, people with C-sections? Uh, it's a possibility, because, you know, that would be in the EULA, and nobody reads those. Oh, okay. We just click accept, you know. Got gotcha. So somebody may show up here one day and give me a C-section. That's a good point. That'd be creepy. You know, that's... That's always a possibility, like in Meaning of Life, because they find a donor card. Live organ transplants. That's right. (laughs) 
So uh, we are on Stitcher. Apparently, they have an app so you can listen to us on your phone. Uh, but I think iTunes has that as well. And we're on YouTube. And we are on YouTube, yes. We're everywhere. Yes. Now, you don't have to ex- exactly watch it on YouTube, but click it before you go to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't really have to look at the ad. Just click it, and maybe we get a nickel. <laughs> and like I've said on my blog, if you do not go and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, then the terrorist win. The terrorist that makes you a win. bad person. Wouldn't it possibly even be like a venal sin? Yeah, it probably it probably is a sin somewhere. There's enough religions out there that it's probably a sin to not subscribe to our podcast. Yeah, yeah. Might have to do some some more research on that, but you know. Well, yeah. You don't really want to go to anybody's help. Just subscribe to the podcast. It's a lot easier that way. And yeah. Don't take a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I. Now, what is this week's movie? The Trip. The Trip. By Roger Corman. Yes. Man, Roger Corman. <laughs> written by Jack Nicholson. Yes, written by Jack Nicholson, the man who wrote such movies as The Head and other... Did he write anything else? I can't imagine that he wrote too much else before he became famous. Uh, let's see here. Let's look him up on IMDb and see his writing credits. He He couldn't have gotten the chance to write too much before he became huge. Yeah. Which is which is almost a shame because he, he was he was you know, what he did write was pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Let's see here. Drive, he said, screenplay, hero, head, trip. Ride in the Whirlwind, Flight to Fury, and Thunder Island. Uh, and that's it. And then, then after that, I guess he just became huge. I liked him it, in Tommy. It doesn't look like any of the other ones have been produced. Just uh, the trip and head. Hmm, that's interesting. Because he was a, I mean, The Trip is a well-written film, and uh, Head is amazing. Head is amazing. Oh, but Roger Corman. Roger Corman. I love and hate Roger Corman. I I love him from just a certain filmmaker's perspective. Yeah. You know, How his, so? His films are shit, but he himself yeah. is a genius that he has been able to successfully keep making movies and making money off of them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's a part of me that I think, like, I think the majority of my hatred for Roger Corman is just a... I guess like a sort of jealousy because I love Ed Wood so much, but Ed Wood made movies quickly, but he had heart to them and nobody cared and he died penniless. Roger Corman made movies cheaply and as quickly as possible just to make a buck, and he gets an Oscar for it. Well, it's a lifetime achievement. He kind of deserves a lifetime achievement. But yeah, he has no heart about it, you know. Um, yeah. Every now and then he'll throw his heart behind a particular movie, but for the most part, it's a completely just dollars and cents fucking thing. You yeah. Know? So yeah, that there is the big difference between he and Ed Wood. Ed Wood absolutely loved what he was doing and would do whatever to get a film finished. Yeah. 
he's made some movies that I I do absolutely love. Like yeah. uh, he was the producer on Death Race 2000, and I loved that movie. Mm-hmm. 1975, running down people. I <laughs> love that movie. That movie. Um, first Sylvester Stallone's first movie. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what Dementia 13? That's a pretty oh, good. Oh, I don't. Bizarre I film. hate that movie. Yeah. I hate that movie. Yeah, you know, but but the idea of it puts a smile on my face. Yeah. You know? I've only watched it once, and I just can't go back because I, I can't stand it. But Francis Ford Coppola? Yeah. You know, okay? Francis, yeah. That makes me smile, like, ear to ear, just like, okay, cool. You and there was a period in time too. when I was in <laughs> – there was a period in time when I was in high school and college that literally I would try and watch A Bucket of Blood just every day. I just absolutely – I just fell in love with that movie. I fell in love with uh, Walter Paisley, Dick Miller, just just that yeah. whole film. I just became obsessed with it, and I just loved it. I did loved notice, Dick Miller. Did you notice Dick Miller in the beginning of the trip? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I screamed. Yeah, I screamed. Once I saw yeah. him, just the first day, Dick Miller! Dick Miller! <laughs> I was so excited. And he I probably was children. Walter Paisley. Yeah, probably. I trained my kids to listen for the the, the Wilhelm scream. Yes. <laughs> I, I've trained my kids to, to listen for it, and I told them that, hey, you know, there was once this stunt guy, and his last name was Wilhelm, and he screamed so good that people recorded his scream and used them in a bunch of movies, and they still do to this day, and here's what the scream sounds like, and now let's go watch movies, and you will hear it. And it appears in just, I say, like about 75% of the, the, the kiddie movies that they see. With like yeah. uh, uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, uh, Despicable Me, Despicable Me 2. I mean, it, it's in all of these little kiddie films. And it, I, I've trained my kids to know this so much that uh, even if my my littlest, Maxwell, who just turned three, if he's watching a movie and he'll hear it, he'll say, Scream! Scream, Daddy, scream. That was the scream, Daddy. That was the scream. <laughs> and that's how I felt when I saw Dick Miller in this movie. I, I was like, oh, Dick Miller, Dick Miller, that's Dick Miller. I was in love with this man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I guess it's a jealousy. It's a jealousy because he, Roger Corman and Ed Wood are the two sides of the same coin. You know, yeah. they they were both of that time where they were making movies and making them cheaply and as quickly as possible and just trying to get it done. And it, I do feel that, however, that he has somehow made, I don't know how, I, he's made a lasting impression on society, perhaps due to the fact that he's still alive. But... Yeah, it's quite it's quite impressive. I think that there wouldn't have been like a Sharknado and a Sharknado Two if he wasn't doing these movies in the fifties and sixties. I mean, he was a producer of a lot of them, like Dino Shark and Sharktopus, uh, right. uh, Dino Croc and Super Gator, all of those sort of things. I mean, he was making he he did help make some of those. But then he also acts sometimes. Like, I just learned that he was in The Godfather Part 2. Uh, yes, he was. He was, uh, <clears throat> when, um... He was, he was he Senator was, he Number was 2. Congressional hearing, yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. always knew that he appeared in, um, what is that, uh, Apollo 13. He's in Apollo 13. I knew that. I don't think I ever noticed that. Yeah, he's he, in the beginning. They're giving like um, reporters and senators just a look at the spaceship, and he's just right there. He's got like a line or two. Like oh. there he is acting with the man, the man who like wrote, produced, and directed the Beast with a Million Eyes. Now gets to act with Tom Hanks. <laughs> It's a bit odd. 
Exactly, exactly. But he launched a million careers, you know? Yeah, the guy absolutely started so <laughs> many people. He yeah. really gave like a, like a, gave Francis Ford Coppola, gave him his first shot. Martin Scorsese directed a movie for him, Boxcar Bertha. Yeah. Um, Joe Jonathan Dante. Demme. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He gave him a shot. Ron Howard, he directed a Grand Theft Auto. How come Ron Howard hasn't been in any of those, uh, it hasn't been in any of the Fast and the Furious movies? He was in the first Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Can't you have, like, The Rock and, you know, Opie in a scene really quick? There'd be, there'd be nothing wrong with that. I'm I'm really kind of pulling for Ron Howard for Expendables 4. That's, Ooh, that's where I want to nice. see him. That'd be nice. <laughs> Speaking of a bucket of blood, um, if anyone is interested, did and hopefully uh, this movie will stay on YouTube long enough for us to feature it in one of our podcasts. But I heard that in 1995 they made a uh, Showtime made a an updated remake of A Bucket of Blood. Really? Yeah. It. it it, it played late at night on Showtime once or twice. They changed the name from A Bucket of Blood to The Death Artist. And it was starring, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, CS3. Anthony Michael Hall plays Walter oh, okay. Paisley. And then the art guy who does the the poem, I will talk to you of art, for there is nothing else to talk about. That's uh, Shadow Stevens. The radio DJ? Yeah. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, uh, Jennifer Coolidge is in it, and uh, is, uh, David Cross is in it as a small part. Justine Bateman is the love interest, except in St- Carla, except now she's like Euro trash. They've really updated it. They updated it for it to be set in like a coffee shop during that like '95 poetry slam hipster piercing sort of a period of time, you know, yeah. uh, tribal tattoos and stuff like that. It's it's a it's interesting, but I haven't had a chance to watch the whole. I haven't gotten through the whole movie because I just love the original so much that it's it's difficult for me to watch the remake. Yeah. But I spent a decade looking for it. I spent a, literally a decade looking for this movie, and I just found it. Um, the follower must sent me a uh, like an MP4 of it, and I figured out that it doesn't look like anyone owns the rights anymore to it. So I put it on YouTube, and it's up there right now on my YouTube page. It's Will Ferrell's first movie. Really? I, I'm seeing it on IMDb from 1995. Yeah, he plays the character of Young Man. He's just some burnout in the coffee shop, but I'm surprised that Will Ferrell's first movie isn't something that's available, because it's not on DVD, it used to be on VHS, but it's out of print now. It took so long for me to try and find this movie. It's really interesting. Yeah, The Death Artist. But it really is at times just a like a shot for shot remake. They occasionally update some of the language and a bit of the gore, but a lot of times the movie is exactly the same. It opens with that big long bit of poetry and they change right. some of the wording, but essentially it's the exact same thing. Are 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 they as beautifully pretentious as they were in the first movie? Shadow Stevens does a pretty good of pretentious artist, but I'm not exactly sure if he's acting or not. <laughs> I felt the so same thing when I better. I felt the same thing when I watched Twenty One Jump Street, the remake. I said, "Oh well, hey, you know he plays a really good stupid guy, but I'm not sure if he's acting too much, <laughs> playing a stupid guy." <laughs> 
Yeah, but something tells me Shadow Stevens didn't really have to uh, stretch too much. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Um, just one thing, though. When I said that Francis Ford Coppola sucked, I actually meant that as a compliment for when he did uh, Dimension 13. I am a really big believer in sucking at things. Yeah. Where else do you start? Mm. You know, what do you do that is worth doing that you don't suck at at first? And then you just keep doing it and you get better. And then Francis Ford Coppola, he always makes the godfather. (laughs) You know? Yeah. It starts with Dimension 13. Makes the godfather. Slips a little when he makes Jack. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, getting older. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did Jack. Isn't that crazy? Freaking Jack. Oh, God, that movie's horrible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Over-sentimental, just trite. You know, just designed to make you cry. Like, it's in the script. Audience cries. Yeah. <laughs> You know. When 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 Robin Williams died, my my Facebook just exploded with people, and and they were all talking about the one thing that Robin Williams did that moved them, and they were talking yeah. about oh well this movie meant so much to me, oh but this movie meant so much to me, oh when I was growing up blank was always on the TV, and I couldn't think of one Robin Williams one thing that Robin Williams did that moved me enough to really be moved by his death or saddened by his death. And it took me like a month. But I finally figured out the one thing that Robin Williams did that moves me. Which one? Um, It's a documentary about Andy Kaufman called I'm From Hollywood. And it's a documentary focusing solely on his wrestling career. And they interview all these people. They interview all these people that know him, and they interview, like, the cast of Taxi, and they interview uh, Bob Zamuda, and they interview his his um, his manager, and they, they have interviews from him. But then, and I always thought that this was serious. I always thought that, since this is a documentary, I always thought that this was a serious thing. Robin Williams is is the super depressed and concerned best friend who is who is left by Andy Kaufman because he's addicted to a drug and that drug is wrestling. Huh. And when I was little, I always said, oh, Robin Williams, he's such a funny guy and he's so sad in this. I feel so bad for him. Now I realize that it was all bullshit. But I didn't know that at the time. I thought, oh, well, look at how sad Robin Williams is. He actually, he ends the whole documentary and I can't believe that I thought that this was real. But Robin Williams looks, he's looking down on the floor and he's all sad and depressed. And finally he looks at the camera and says, and this is the actual line he says. He says, I knew our relationship was over when he put me in a headlock and said goodbye. (laughs) And I think at one point in time he says, you can always tell when he's jonesing because he wears the wrestling belt underneath his regular clothes. That's that's yeah. when you know that he's trying to get a wrestling match going somewhere. Talking about him <laughs> like he's a drug addict and stuff. And it wasn't until I was much older that I realized, oh, wait a second, that was bullshit. <laughs> oh, yeah, wrestling is fake, and Robin Williams was just kind of fucking with me. Once oh, I yeah. remember that, I'm like, oh, oh, man, okay, well, then, yes, rest in peace, Robin Williams. That, that reminds me of a story. Huh. Well, I want to hear a story of my mutant life that has nothing to do with Robin Williams. <laughs> All righty, then. It's a, it's a little on the long side. I'll try to go through it. Okay. So, um, so I've pretty much been a writer all my life, okay? Okay. And the biggest thing I'm really interested in is either horror or science fiction, you know, one of those two. Because that's what I grew up with. You know, so yeah. that's what I was really interested in. And I was also a big fan of reading Omni Magazine. Remember Omni? Oh, yeah, I remember Omni Magazine. Yeah. And it ha- used to have pieces of short fiction in there. Um, 
I used to I used to love Orson Scott Card before he turned into a big dick. Yeah. And I I never liked any of his books. His short stories were very Twilight Zony and excellent. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm writing short stories of my own. I'm around I'm somewhere between eleven and thirteen. Okay, somewhere in there. So I, I finish up a short story, and I have it all typed up. And I was like, I'll send it to Tommy Magazine. That's what I'll do. I'll get it in there. <laughs> okay. And yeah. I have to find where they are. So I, I'm living on Long Island. Um, I looked up the address on the front cover of the magazine, and I called information to get the number. <clears throat> So I call the number, and I hear, hello, Penthouse Magazine. <laughs> I didn't notice at the time, but Penthouse owned Omni, and I am, I am like prepubescent to pubescent. <laughs> My hormones are fine, and, and I'm just like, humna, 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 humna. <laughs> uh, but she was very sweet. <laughs> nice. I, I told her what I wanted. I wanted to submit uh, a short story to Omni Magazine, and she uh, gave me the information, and I wrote it down. And at that time, um, the editor of the fiction department was uh, Ben Bova, famous science fiction writer. <laughs> so, you know, that's who I would address it to. Uh, Self-address, stamped envelope, all that kind of shit. And I go ahead and do that. And then it's out of my head. Yeah. And I am walking down. I, I'm, I'm later on. I'm I'm working in Manhattan. I'm I'm like 19 years old. And I'm walking down the street. And you know how when there are those times when you have nothing on your mind. Yeah. Some strange thought out of fucking nowhere just pops up. Yeah, I have that all the time. I addressed that envelope to Mr. Ben Dover. (laughs) (laughs) I look up and I laugh for a second and I'm like, ah, shit. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Mr. (laughs) Ben Dover. Probably he didn't even read it. <laughs> probably not. He's probably just like, uh, oh, it's another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it out. So I don't know what reminded me of that, but it's a funny story, so I just wanted to tell it. It is a funny story. I like funny stories. <laughs> funny stories so... of complete embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of those. <laughs> so, the trip. What did you think of the trip? It was a good movie. At times it felt like a like an Easy Rider prequel. Yeah. But, it, it, as much as it's a good movie and, and the, the, the visuals are very good, it, they they seem to do a good job with sh- showing you visually what a an experience a drug experience feels like. It also did have that bit of a Roger Corman stink. Yeah, there were times watching it where I felt like Roger Corman made this movie because it was going to be about drugs which meant that it would be easy to film and they didn't need as big of a script and they could just show a bunch of colors and lights and, okay, save time. It seemed as if there were like five or ten minute periods of this film where the script probably just said, uh, Paul Groves trips, walks outside, (laughs) trips, goes back inside, trips, and that's like ten minutes of the movie. But I wanted, talking about this movie, I wanted to talk about drugs. Okay. I have never done LSD before. So I felt like I was at, 
I, I was at a disadvantage watching this movie. I, I have nothing to yeah. base this on. And I, I and it's sometimes I watching this movie, I wondered, is this pro LSD or anti LSD? Because I'm used to seeing a lot of movies from the 50s and 60s that feature drugs, but in a negative way. I I felt that I've never done acid either, but it is on my bucket list. Okay. Yeah. Um, I felt that it was trying to walk the line and be as fair as it could even though it was obviously written by people who were pro-acid. Yeah, but then you, you see know, the poster. But there were certainly negative parts of it. Yeah. You know, there were parts where the trip was starting to go bad and things like that, and he would do unusual things, you know, just walk yeah. into somebody's house and start talking to their little girl. <laughs> Not the best thing in the world to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but then the... But then the poster for the movie, it says, LSD, a lovely sort of death. <laughs> and that certainly does say to me, okay, this is going to be a negative look at LSD. And then at the end, where, uh, uh, what's his name? Glenn asks him, it's like, so, did you... Uh, was the experience constructive or whatever? And he says, uh, his answer is like, tomorrow, and his face is frozen. And then the image cracks like glass. And I thought, oh, well, okay, so is that a negative ending? Is that a positive ending? Yeah. Were they just looking to end the film? I was a bit confused by it. I guess I'm just we have confused. told our story. Now you decide. <laughs> right? What do yeah. you, the viewer at home, think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, mean, um, I, never... I, I felt it 50-50. You know, there, there are quite a few bits of his trip that were very positive, you know, and things that he was getting into, like, like seeing light all over coming from the orange, although I wish they showed that, yeah. you know. Um, we got into a good dose of Lord of the Rings fantasies. Yeah. With dwarves and prancing through the woods and stuff. Yeah, when um, suddenly you see, like, a, a puffy shirt Peter Fonda. Yeah. Uh-huh. I have a puffy shirt now. This is a fantasy scene. Yeah, so so that's that's some of the reasons I feel like they tried to walk the line, you know, yeah. and do as fair, I guess, a depiction as they could. Yeah. You know, because again, there was there was positives, but it wasn't all positive. Yeah. And we did have a shirtless Dennis Hopper. Shirtless Dennis Hopper, yes. <laughs> That's a poster. That should be that should be like one side of a poster, and the other side Sean Connery from Zardoz. <laughs> Put those two right next to each other. <laughs> when I think Dennis Hopper, I think. Um, unfortunately, when I think Dennis Hopper, I think of that horrible Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah. I, I was not a fan of Dennis Hopper. I, you know, when I think of Dennis Hopper, I think of Dennis Hopper. Look, that's Dennis Hopper. You know, I don't I don't ever, like, really buy into any of his performances. I did know? love him. I did love him in, out of all the Dennis Hopper movies, is there's one movie where I can say, okay, this is, I love this. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. I love uh, him in that. The, the original? I, I was so lost track with the damn Texas James movie. No, the second one. In the second one, he's the he's he's like a normal sheriff, and he really wants to stop them. And then he just keeps going more and more insane until at the end, he's just he's got a freaking chainsaw, and he's going nuts, and he's screaming, and he's just freaking out. Well, I mean, I mean, the, like the original from. 
the from like the first run movies, not like yeah, yeah, the remake Texas Chainsaw Two or whatever it was. No, not the remake. Okay. He, uh, the 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 second one from '86. Yeah, the one with Bill Mosley, and he kept scratching his head with the, his metal yeah. plate with the hanger. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah, that in a while. I'm gonna have to read yeah, it. Yeah, he was lefty. The, <laughs> the the lieutenant, the former Texas Ranger, and he's the uncle of the the Sally and the Franklin in the wheelchair who were victims, and so. He he spent the last thirteen years investigating, and and then at the end he just goes nuts. I liked him in that because he wasn't yeah. really trying to act; he was just being crazy, Dennis Hopper. I am gonna have to find that movie and check it out again. It's pretty good. Pretty good. But Dennis Hopper just as a whole, I've never, I haven't really seen him in anything much that's knocked me out. And I kind of find feel the same way about Malcolm McDowell too. Malcolm McDowell. Oh, Caligula! For Christ's yeah. sake, Caligula! Oh yeah. man. The movie would have been a lot better without him. Just like let's just get back to the sex. <laughs> Malcolm McDowell. I I respect him because he was in Community, and I loved I that never show. I love watch that show. It's really good. It's just fun and silly and stupid and cute, and I just fell in love with it. And I just I I I don't do a lot of binge watching. I'm not that no. type of a person, and I have kids, so it's it's difficult for me to sit and binge watch something. But I, I spent, like, a good two weeks and just watched all, what, five seasons of that show, and I loved it. And he was a teacher for, like, a season in that show. And I'm like, good for you, Malcolm McDowell, to be on, like, a... I thought that he was too conceited to stoop so low as to be on a low-rated NBC comedy. Yeah. Well, he did do Heroes. <laughs> oh, God, Heroes. That was good for, like, two seconds, and then it just disappeared. Into yeah, the they, they they were not able to survive the writer's strike. Yeah. By the time the writer's also, strike was over. Was and also, it probably would have helped, probably would have helped if the person who created the show actually knew something about comic books. Yeah. So I read an interview in Entertainment Weekly where there were two there were two people, the person who was like creating everything and then the other person who actually knew stuff about comic books. And then the person who created the show would say something like, I've got an idea. How about we have a character on the show that can control metal? And then the other person would go, okay, that, somebody already has that. Pick something <laughs> else. Oh, somebody has that? Yeah, he's called Magneto. Oh, I've never heard of him. Okay, we know you've never heard of him, but just pick something else. <laughs> it's a and, darn you shame. Know, the first season wasn't bad, and then after that it was very much like, okay, you know, everything will be okay if you guys all just stop fucking with each other. Yeah. Because nothing is really happening here anymore. You're just kind of dicking with each other. Oh, but there was a, there was. I I think back fondly to uh, like a like a year or two in my life when I was in love with that guy who played Hero. Oh well, he was excellent. He was the best part of the show. I was just in love with that man, and then it just, and then the show just dragged me down. Yeah. Oh God! Yeah. That damn show. I, I really, I really liked watching Siler act. I just didn't quite like what he was doing. Yeah. You know. I'm glad. I'm glad did he did well. Yeah, I'm glad he made something of himself. He, and, and he was a perfect choice to spot, man, because his his face oh, yeah. is just so. He, he had the ability because you see it in Siler. He, he had the ability to be very subtle in his performance and his little facial gestures which wound up saying tons. Yeah. 
about what he was thinking and what was going on with him. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I thought, uh, you know, I think that really made him the perfect choice to be Spock. Mm-hmm. I agree. I liked those reboots. Those two reboots of the Star Treks. I really liked those. I was surprised. I, I didn't think I was going to like them. Yeah, I liked the first one. I haven't been so hot on the second one yet. But Benedict Cumberbatch is in it. <laughs> you can't you can't hate a movie that features him because his name is so fun to say. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch. You say that word and then just magical elves appear and sprinkle fairy dust on you. Benedict it sounds, Cumberbatch. It sounds like a warm Sunday morning. You know, you open up the oven and there are fresh cumberbatches in there. Ah. Uh, you know, and and a stick of butter, you know? Yeah. So I'm just taking all the cumberbatch and stick going of back butter. to yeah. yes. <laughs> Ten pounds of Paladine butter and fresh fresh Benedict cumberbatches. And it's just, I'm going back to bed, and I'm going to watch It Conquered the World on Netflix. <laughs> it Conquered the World is on Netflix? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it might be. I know it's and, on YouTube. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, Jeannie and I took, out, took the Sunday off to just relax in bed, watch shit, and, and eat snacky kind of foods. Yep. You know? So I had watched uh, Sleeper, Big Ass Spider, uh, Jay and Silent Bob, Super Ruby Movie. I that put was. that on my queue, but it seems like my love of Jay and Silent Bob was a lifetime ago. And I yeah. just don't know if I can... You know, that was a different me, and I was drinking a lot more and going out a lot more, and now I've got a wife and kids, and I just don't know if I can get myself to sit down and watch a Jay and Silent Bob anything anymore. Yeah. Um, it is one that I chose to nap to, and it was very good to nap to. Uh, it was well, written good. by... Jason Hughes, so it is a lot more immature than mm. your usual Dan and Silent Bob, you know, so gotcha. it was like a lot of boners and a lot of masturbating jokes and, you know. Did you see like Kevin, did you see Kevin Smith's movie Red State? I liked Red State a lot. I loved that movie. Absolutely yeah. loved that movie. I didn't know he was capable of making a movie that Beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I feel a lot of kinship with Kevin Smith. I'm really a big fan, you know, which does not necessarily make me a big fan of all of his movies. I like a yeah. lot of them. I, I like some more than others. Uh, you know, but we're about the same age, and we come from right about the same place. You yeah. know? So a lot of the stories he'll come out with on his podcast and things like that, it's like, oh, fuck, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, and we would be talking about, like, small electronic chains that really didn't get a chance to get out in New York, you know, things like that, like Crazy Eddie's. I don't know if you know Crazy Eddie's. I'm vaguely aware of it, but no. Yeah. It just had this announcer. It was an electronic store, and it crashed when the owner embezzled like a lot of the money from the store or some shit like that. But they had this announcer who was just he was just a character. He was he was very funny and very interesting. And he plays the, the commercial he is in plays a brief cameo in the movie Splash. Oh yeah? Where where he just pops up on the television. Um you know, so things like that, things that just kind of bring memory. So, like, I have a fondness for Kevin Smith on that kind of level. 
okay. you know, like, because he could have, like, been a classmate or something, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. But. The trip. <laughs> I, I just recently learned that uh, I went to the same high school as the band Fun. Yeah. As the lead singer of the band Fun, and and he 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 sang a bunch of songs that just would constantly play for a while. He uh, some nights, and uh, we are young. And now he just did a duet with he did a duet with Pink, and then he just did a duet with Eminem. And apparently he graduated about four or five years after I did at the same high school in Glendale, Cal- Glendale, Arizona. Yeah. And I'd like to think that he wasn't sure if he could be a singer. So he would go to the Deer Valley High School library and stare up at my picture on the wall because I was student of the year. And <laughs> seeing my smiling face gave him the confidence to be a singer. So if that you ever hear a awesome, dude. Yeah, so if you ever hear a song sung by Nate Ruiz, or if you hear a song by the band Fun, then you're welcome. <laughs> that is awesome. You fucking rock, man. That is great. Look what you yeah. did. Look yeah. what you fucking did. Man, I don't know if I can become a singer. Oh, but look at this guy, Steve Galindo. He was student of the year, and he followed his dreams. Maybe I could be like him. Maybe I can be like him, you know, some nights. And then he got his idea for the song Some Nights, like uh, Dewey Cox in Walk Hard. Yeah. He just looked to the side and went, Some Nights. <laughs> and then right there he wrote the song. And so, you're welcome, America. Because that was all me taking credit for it. Good, good, good. You know who else I really like to hear for that same sort of a thing? Hmm. Nick Foley. Mick oh, Foley, Mick Foley. He'll be talking about, yeah, he'll be talking about his his like high school wrestling days, you know, and going from school to school. And I know those schools. I went to one of those schools. Yeah, and <laughs> he know? and he was on the wrestling team with um some yeah. actor guy King of Queens. King of yeah, Queens. Yeah, King of Queens. Yeah, he was in the wrestling um, team with him. There's a lot of the Adam Sandler movies now. Yeah. Mick Foley is like one of two or three wrestlers that, you know, that is just a wonderful storyteller and a wonderful writer. Uh, A book that just came out, uh, the third book by Chris Jericho. Really? Yeah. And Chris, it's, it's, it's the third book that he's written and no ghost writer or anything like that. And, uh, his writing style is exactly as fun as it is to watch him. Yeah. Just really fun and funny and breezy and comfortable, and you feel like you really know him, and there's some real laugh-out-loud scenes. In his first book, he's traveling with WCW, and they're in, like, a hotel somewhere, and some guy comes into his hotel room with what he assumed was a small Mexican child who was like okay. five foot one, five foot two. And I'm like, oh, what is what is Bart doing in here with this small Mexican child? Okay, whatever. And so they're talking, and the small Mexican child isn't saying anything. And next thing you know, uh, the guy who's talking uh, pulls out a joint and starts smoking it, and Chris Jericho just slaps it out of his mouth. And goes, what are you doing? You can't smoke in front of this kid. And it, it, apparently that kid was Rey Mysterio with his mask off. Because <laughs> he is a short guy. He is a little guy. Yeah. But his story... I, I is haven't a- watched wrestling in a while, but Rey Mysterio was always so cool to watch, man. He He just had such beautiful moves. Yep. And for, like, actual wrestling wrestling, those are the guys I liked. I liked the High Flyers, you know, Rey yeah. Mysterio, the Hardy Boys, Hardy yeah. Brothers, or whatever. Um, Hardy Boys 
with a Z. Double the Z, double the flavor. <laughs> flavor. <laughs> Did you notice for the Rock of Ages episode on Facebook, I went and I found every star's page on Facebook. Really? From Rock of Ages. And I liked it. So that I could tag them directly in the post. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Rock of Ages. Man, Stacey Jacks is amazing. So, So there is a possibility that Tom Cruise may have heard of us now. <laughs> if Tom Cruise hasn't heard of us through the podcast, then he certainly knows me through my absolute hatred of Scientology. So, oh. either way. Oh, uh, you got to love Scientology. Come on. You know, he knew. You know, sentence in volcanoes. You know, they know how to write. You know what? Stuff. I feel about Scientology the same way that I feel about Roger Corman. Because I feel like, hey, I have created this religion based on Ed Wood, and I've spent, what, 13, 14 years on it, and I would like a little bit of uh, credit and appreciation and acceptance for it, and uh, I, I get some of that, but not a lot. And here comes L. Ron Hubbard and said, I just made this shit up. And then suddenly he's <laughs> all over the place. Mm-hmm. And it's just, oh, God, I hate Scientology. I hate it because it's uh, bullshit and it ruins lives and also because they're successful. I, yes, yeah. I, There's more I to my religion really, than there is to Scientology. I would really love to be part of... <clears throat> the deprogramming team for either Tom Cruise or uh, John Travolta, you know, because it would just be like, okay, look, you sucked the cock. Admit it. You just, just admit it. You did it. You don't have to hide behind Scientology because they're telling you it's all evil and all that, and you got all the sentence, and you hold on to the little tin cans that tell your emotions and all that, you know. Just, just say you like the cock. Admit it. Like in, like in 1990s, <laughs> 98, 99, 2000, around there, I knew some people, and they were in Hollywood, and they had worked in Hollywood, and they were extras and, and uh, like, uh, assistants on the set and stuff like that, and they would all say the same thing. You won't believe this, but I think that John Travolta is gay. And me and my friends would all say the same thing. What? No. You, that's crazy. And they're like, yeah, it's the biggest secret in show business. And so when stories actually started to leak, I was like, oh, so, okay then. All right. I kind of knew this like a decade ago, but apparently this is really a thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, Tom Cruise, God, he can be a really good actor sometimes, and I hate that about him. I absolutely hate that. I hate, (laughs) I hate that. John Travolta is Pulp Fiction, man. Like, sometimes he can find the zone, and other times he just can't. Yeah. Yeah. You know? He's done some really horrible movies, but every every once in a while something will pop up, and it's like, okay, well, blank is good. And blank is good. He's like like the golden earring of actors. Yeah. You know? Pop up every 10, 20 years or so. Make a good song. Go away again. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I hope, like, I I really want to see the movie Birdman with Michael Keaton. Because now everybody's saying, oh, Michael Keaton's having a comeback. And if there's anyone who deserves to pop back up, it's that man. He did really good. He was a good first Batman for America. He was a very good Batman. Other than that, there was always something about Michael Keaton that just rubbed me the wrong way. Really? I was I okay love... with him being Batman, but any, anything else I ever saw him in, he just always had that smirky kind of asshole-ish, like, eh, ah, fuck you. He was, he was good in, <laughs> you know? in um, Beetlejuice. I mean, that's amazing. I remember liking him in Jackie Brown. I remember at the yeah. time not liking too much about Jackie Brown, but 
okay, Samuel Jackson's amazing, and uh, De Niro, it's weird that you're in this film, but yeah, you're doing a good job, and Michael Keaton, good for you. Gun Ho! That's <laughs> such a great <laughs> movie. <laughs> Gun Ho, and Mr. Mom, God. God, that was a wonderful movie. <laughs> Oh, and you know what else? Now that I'm thinking about it, Johnny We're Dangerously. Talking. Johnny Dangerously. I, I think I would appreciate that a lot more now. Than yeah, I, I don't think I've seen that. Th- I haven't seen that in like 10 years or something, but God, that was a good movie. At the time, it was one of those movies that seemed like it was constantly on, so I really got to hate it. Yeah. You know, some movies, it's like every time you turn on the fucking television, there's that goddamn movie again. Yeah. You know. Um, but we should wrap up this episode. Oh, we... can't we stay and talk for another two hours about Rock of Ages? <laughs> <laughs> such a great movie. <laughs> w- which one? Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. Oh, yeah, God. forget about the trip. Let's forget about that. Peter Fonda, he did a fine job. Roger Corman kind of sucks sometimes. Let's just let's just have an all Rock of Ages podcast. We'll just talk about it every week. Rock of Ages. <laughs> there, there used to be a, a podcast that just did Glee. <laughs> Until they were like. Yeah, this show kind of sucks now. <laughs> is is Glee still popular? Is Glee still a thing? Is it still on the air? I think it's still on the I air. I have no idea. I my girlfriend Glee likes just, it a lot. And Glee I'm is just one of those shows. On. Glee is just one of those things where it was too popular for me to like it, so I just stayed away. Yeah. And there's there's so much of that in my life. I almost saw it when they did a Rocky Horror episode, but then I said, no, I can't even watch that. <laughs> How's as the Firefly going? Huh? How's the Firefly going? Firefly is good. Firefly is really good. I'm really yeah. liking the show. It's really good. I always liked, uh, what's his name, Nathan Fillion. Yeah. I always loved him. He was also on Community which is a wonderful, wonderful show. I mean, I, all of those people who were on Firefly, I knew them, f- most of them, from so many other things. That yeah. going back to this show, I can go, oh, okay, I, I, is, isn't that guy from um, Barney Miller? And this guy's from Dr. Horrible. This person is from this. This person is from that. So it, I'm already so familiar with the people, with the actors in the show, that it, it, it's really, it's a really comfortable show to just slip into. I'm just absolutely in love with it. I'm just pacing myself because I know I have a limited number of shows and I just don't want to get hurt yet. That's probably a good idea. Yeah, because they, they run out kind of quick. They're only 13. Uh, I was kind of late to the Firefly party too uh and didn't didn't really watch anything until I saw Serenity first. Oh you saw the you saw Serenity first. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then after having seen Serenity then after and like not even immediately, but after a while I was like, oh, I should check out Firefly. Yeah. Well I'm and definitely I can watch them. Well I'm definitely hitting uh Serenity after I finish this show. So <laughs> Cool. That's going to be difficult, I think. I just hate getting to the end of these shows and series and all of that. It just breaks my heart. I'm too sensitive. I'm a sensitive man. Yeah. Uh, you must have heard that they're, they're bringing Twin Peaks back. They're bringing what? Twin Peaks back. Yes. And Twin Peaks is another one of those shows where everyone I knew just wouldn't stop talking about it, so I just kind of backed off. I think I saw a couple of, like, a couple of the first episodes, but it just became too much of a talking point for me to, to like, yeah. join in the group, so I stayed away when it was first it's, on. But I'm also it, thinking of trying to tackle that one. Yeah. It's been 25 years. You can go back. It's safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I've always loved Kyle Mo- 
Kyle McCluckin. Yeah. McCluck, cluck, cluck. So I always liked him. So that I might have to tackle that one next. Cool. I want to watch all of Doctor Who, but apparently that's technically impossible. Uh, from what I understand, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of missing episodes, especially the earlier ones. Yeah. I want to try and at least watch every Doctor from the beginning to whatever's the newest and just try my best to, to watch not all of them, but as many of them as I can. It's the Tom Baker ones where the Doctor really took off. Is that the fourth Doctor and the colorful scarf and all that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the Doctor that I remember. That was always on PBS at like like a Sunday afternoon or sometime during the weekend, and I would watch yeah. it, and I would fall in love with it, but then just completely forget it. Like I, yeah. I remember growing up and saying, oh, wait, so Doctor Who, this is a big, huge thing? I had no clue. It's it's For me, it's like a good show when you're doing something else. Yeah. You know, like 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 so many movies, when you were a kid and you were you were watching these old movies in front of the television, but you know at the same time you were playing with your Hot Wheels cars or you were coloring or things like that. Yeah. You know the kinds of things we would do to get through really bad movies just so we could see the part that had the monster. You know. Um. It, Doctor Who, the early ones, not this new run, but the early ones before that, was kind of like that for me because the sets shot so bad. You know, there was like yeah. really nothing to look at. You know. Mm-hmm. So it'd be time to do other things and just kind of listen to it and, and get into the story that way. Well, that's that's good. Like like I love. I love Arrested Development. I love that show. But I learned <laughs> very quickly that that's not a show you cannot pay attention to. Yeah. Because I like having a show in the background. Arrested Development is not one of those shows. You kind of have to pay attention. Yeah. So I'm, I might yeah. like Doctor Who. It might be nice to kind of have it on. So I like shows like that. <laughs> So what movie are we doing next week? Next week, we are doing It Came From Hollywood, which All really right. is just my first foray into bad movies. <laughs> it really is just, oh, it's such a wonderful movie. It's so great. It's on YouTube. Go and see it. It Came From Hollywood. It's got Gilda Radner and Cheech and Chong in it, for Christ's sake. It's a wonderful movie. It's just a, a celebration of bad films, and it really yeah, is amazing. Go, go watch it on YouTube and meet us back here. <laughs> exactly. Meet us back here next week, loyal <laughs> listeners. And remember, we have the Pope on Film page on Facebook to go and like. Yes. We are on Twitter at Pope on Film. The email address is pope at undeadcow.com. We are on Stitcher. And sooner or later, I'll figure out why. And we are on YouTube. (laughs) Yes. And if you'd like to learn more about today's podcast or maybe check out the film that we're talking about, feel free to go to my blog, reverendsteve.blogspot.com. I'm focusing on each one of our podcasts once it comes out and trying as hard as I can to find the actual movie that we're talking about and have that on the blog as well. So this week, the trip, if you want to watch it, it will be there for you. So be sure and check out my blog because it's awesome. It is It is awesome. Yay. It is awesome. You're an excellent writer. You come out with some great articles. Thank you. And, and the, the free movie of the week. Yeah. Love the free movie of the week. And tits. And, a, yeah, occasional cleavage. So it's pretty awesome. <laughs> ReverendSteve.blogspot.com. It's cool. Free movies, <laughs> free mu- free music, uh, jokes about Tucson, Arizona. So check that out. 
Excellent. And we will see you next week on the Pope on Film. I'm Mike next- William. And I'm Reverend Steve, and see you next week, loyal-ish listeners. May Wood be with you. And also with you.